Good evening. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for this wonderful lecture. I would first like to acknowledge and thank uh, Professor Emeritus Wade Clark Roof, uh, for whom this lecture is named. And I would like to acknowledge Interim Director Kathleen Moore of our Walter Cap Center for the Study of Ethics, Religion, and Public Life. Thank you for organizing and hosting this lecture. And uh, I would like to acknowledge the Honorable Lois Capps. She served for 10 terms in the U.S. House of Representatives from 1998 to 2017. I also would like to thank our colleagues and administrators and the deans for joining us tonight. The history of uh, the Wade Clark Roof Human Rights Lecture dates back to uh, 2005. The broad range, broad ranging subject of human rights addressed in this series fully exemplifies Professor Roof's deep concern for humanity and the issue to which he has devoted his life as a scholar and a teacher, including religious pluralism, religion and the politics and the civic values. Uh, thus, it is very fitting to address the matter of freedom of expression under the focus of human rights. Freedom of expression is a fundamental human rights enshrined in Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted in 1948, which states that everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless frontiers. Free speech is not just an American peculiarity. It is a right to be secured around the world. It is no less a human right than the freedom from want and the fear. I'm also so honored uh, and pleased to be with you tonight and to have the opportunity to introduce our distinguished speaker, professor of law, political science, and history at UC Irvine, and their visionary and dynamic leader, Chancellor since 2014, Howard Gilman. Chancellor Gilman has a great understanding of free speech and a great appreciation of what colleagues, colleges and universities, both public and private, uh, can and cannot do when dealing with free speech controversies. In fact, among the chancellors and the presidents of the 62 AAU universities, the 62 Association of American Universities, uh, he has been well recognized, well known as a leading expert in free speech in America. Chancellor Gilman is a native of Southern California. He grew up in North Hollywood and was a first generation college, college student, earning his bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees in political science at UCLA. He is an award-winning scholar and a teacher with expertise in American Constitution and the US Supreme Court. A prolific author, Dr. Gilman has co-authored American Constitutionalism, Powers, Rights, and Liberties, and among others, he has written The Constitution Besieged, The Rise and the Demise of the Lochner Era Police Power Jurisprudence, which received the C. Herman Pritchett Award for Best Book in Public Law and was named the Choice Outstanding Academic Book Selection for 1993. Most recently, he co-authored with Erwin Chemerinsky a book entitled Free Speech on Campus. Yale University Press 2018, which is the topic he will speak about tonight. So we are in for a great treat. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Chancellor Gilman. Thank you. That's so nice. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be back on this beautiful, extraordinary campus. And especially for this evening, and I want to thank you all for coming out uh, so that we can uh, hear a little bit, talk a little bit, and have a conversation about what is becoming for many people our 
favorite topic about higher education in America. Before I get started, I do want to extend my sincere thanks to my dear friend and colleague, Henry Yang, always for being such a gracious host, to everyone at the Walter H. Capps Center for the Study of Ethics, Religion, and Public Life, especially Wade Clark Roof, the Honorable Lois Capps, Professor Kathleen Moore, and really everyone who supports the important mission of the center to infuse our public sphere with considerations of ethics and human rights. So how did I get here? Well, other than driving down from Irvine uh, an easy 150 miles, uh, I got here because in the winter of 2016, I started teaching undergraduate seminars on the topic of free speech on campus with my old friend, Erwin Chemerinsky. At the time, he was the founding dean of the UCI Law School. Now he's doing great work up at Berkeley. We had been teaching a yearly course on the history, the constitutional history of civil rights. But in 2015, uh, there were events that encouraged us to think about changing the topic. There had been protests to prevent speakers such as Condoleezza Rice from speaking on campus. At Yale, you might remember, there was an email from a faculty member head of a residential college that had commented on a campus statement about Halloween costumes that triggered loud and boisterous protests, personal attacks and demands for resignations, all attracting national attention and disrupting campus life. There were successful efforts at Wesleyan to defund the student newspaper after an op-ed that had criticized Black Lives Matter. And this and many other events in 2015 generated a lot of public commentary with one of the most influential articles written in The Atlantic that was entitled The Coddling of the American Mind, where the thesis was offered that what we were witnessing was a generation of students who had become almost pathologically incapable of coping with ideas and views that they found distressing. And before long, once that framing had taken place, these issues were pulled into the culture wars with all of the usual insults, snowflakes, fascists, and the like. So the issue had become so prevalent in our culture in 2016, 2015, 2016, that President Obama even had occasion in some commencement speeches to urge students not to silence speakers they disagreed with, but instead to listen and engage and challenge. Anyway, so when we were planning our winter 2016 seminar, we thought it'd be great, instead of just listening to this thing devolve into the culture wars, to actually spend some time with students discussing these issues. And we had absolutely wonderful students. They were dedicated, they were smart, they did the work, they engaged the issues. And I have to say, given how much this has become a source of uh, political controversy and, uh, and uh, casual commentary, it is a real pleasure to be able to spend every year months and months and months, hours and hours at a time, week after week, talking to students in a, in a context of mutual respect and exchange outside of any particular controversy. And one of the things that you learn when you give yourself the opportunity to do that is that you learn as much from the students as you think you have to offer them. And Erwin and I learned a lot. We heard more than I think the public commentary was listening. We heard that this generation of students has an absolutely admirable concern for the psychological well-being of their peers. This is, after all, one of the first generations that was raised throughout their K through 12 experience on anti-bullying campaigns. All of their high schools had tolerance weeks. Each of them could personally testify to the way in which harmful, demeaning, marginalizing speech imposed real psychological harm on themselves or their peers. Because every single day they were experiencing not just that dynamic in person in school, but also the first generation that was combating bullying and trolling on social media. And by the way, for some of us who, uh, 
remember the days of the anti-war movement and the civil rights movement, uh, if instead of those historic experiences we grew up in an age of yik-yak and internet trolling, it, it may be that we would have second thoughts about what the value of free speech would be as well. Our students were also at an institution that took tremendous pride in the diversity of its community and its commitment to ensuring inclusive learning environments. And this meant, by the way, among other things, that they were in a better position than previous generations of students to hear directly from peers who could testify about the impact that hateful or marginalizing speech had on their experiences and opportunities. Many of the early debates, even the last few decades, about free speech on campus were taking place with a much less diverse student body, and the conversation is improved and sharpened uh, when uh, the lived experiences of people who are often bearing the brunt of the speech that some claim deserve protection can actually testify about what it really means in their lived experience. So in other words, these students were bringing good, important values to these debates. They weren't soft. They didn't want to be coddled. They were among the strongest and most resilient students I've ever met. It's just that they had a strong and understandable intuition that demeaning or hateful speech was just not OK. So we learned that. And that's an important feature for us as we're all trying to engage these issues in this context. But we also learned something else. They had no corresponding intuition to think about the competing value of free expression and no exposure to the history of free speech or in their own direct experiences to seeing the value of deeply protecting speech that other people are trying to censor in order to facilitate social progress. They'd done the human work of knowing what was not OK, but not the historic or the political analytic work of then thinking through the implications of trying to solve this problem with one political strategy, the strategy of empowering government officials to censor or punish people for expressing views. So we experienced firsthand what's been verified by many national surveys. Many students, up to one third on average, support censorship or punishment for speech they consider offensive, and a much higher percentage, two-thirds, support bans on so-called hate speech. They view the promotion of diversity and inclusion as at least as important as protecting free expression. Now, during class, we found that as we sat down and deepened the conversation and made people more familiar with the history and the arguments about the different strategies politically that you could take to deal with uh, the negative aspects of hateful speech, that as should happen if you spend months and months every single week talking to people about these issues, we all began to think more systematically about it. And their views evolved, their arguments improved. Not everyone changed their minds, and we don't teach a class in order to get people to conform to our views. I, I do believe at the end of the class, even people who still had strong opinions about the obligations of institutions and government officials to manage and address the harm of speech, even if they still believe that, they had a much firmer foundation for those arguments, so much the better. It was certainly a better, more satisfying conversation than what we were seeing in the broader public conversation about these issues. So if we wanted to improve the conversation, one strategy that Irwin and I could have adopted is to figure out a way to hold months-long seminars for millions of students around the country. That didn't seem like a strategy that was scalable. And so instead, we took what we learned and we wrote the book on free speech on campus. Now, since that book was written, the national bait has continued with some new twists. Universities are being targeted by extremists and trollers who seek to push boundaries in the hope that they will be silenced and then can claim victim status. Many people who seek access to campuses 
have no real interest in the exchange of ideas, but rather are looking to create drama and conflict, or worse, with some on the other side eager to play that game as well. Last year, for example, we saw the terrible riots at Berkeley, and we witnessed the terrible tragedy unfold in Charlottesville, with tiki torch carrying white supremacists marching in the middle of the University of Virginia. We've seen Richard Spencer taking his hate-filled case to other public universities. And we saw Berkeley put in a position where they had to spend almost $4 million for a free speech week event, ostensibly organized by Mayo Yiannopoulos that was never really intended to take place. Since we wrote the book, state legislatures and members of Congress are getting involved. Attorney General Sessions is speaking out on the importance of this issue. And most recently, we are seeing litigation on the rise. Just this last week, there's some new legal advocacy organizations, one known as Speech First, which has sued the University of Michigan for the activities of its bias response teams, claiming that when people report bias and these teams respond, they're responding in ways that don't fall within the legitimate boundaries of unprotected speech, and that litigation will continue. So there's a lot to discuss. Over the next few minutes, I'd like to do a number of things, hopefully relatively quickly, and we can see what you'd like to talk more about in the question and answer. I'd like to summarize the argument of the book. I'd like to touch on the major arguments in favor of broad protections for free speech. I want to distinguish general free speech arguments from arguments about academic freedom, which is a related but very different way of thinking about the protection especially of the faculty in the professional settings of a university. I want to give some examples of what we think campuses can and can't do when it comes to regulating speech. I have to highlight some of the very challenging issues arising in the wake of Charlottesville and especially how campuses have to think about preventing violence and managing extraordinary security costs and end by returning to the obligation of campuses to promote an inclusive learning environment. So let's start with the main argument of the book. I've been to many presentations where people begin discussing issues of free speech by pointing out that free speech can be very complicated. And it is true, if you look at a typical constitutional law casebook that is just devoted to free speech and the First Amendment, it typically runs more than 1,000 pages. So it can be very complicated, but sometimes you have to keep things simple to get the ball rolling. So here's how we boil down our thesis statement. It may be deceptively simple, but it is, we acknowledge, controversial. Recognizing that campuses have an obligation absolutely to promote an inclusive and non-discriminatory learning environment, we believe nevertheless that they cannot do so by censoring or punishing the mere expression of ideas. In our viewpoint, any view can be expressed on campus without the fear of censorship or punishment, even if it's controversial even if it's considered dangerous, even if it's considered offensive, or it is hostile to members of the community, or even hateful. Now, before we consider the implications of this position, let me note that people can do a lot of things with speech other than express ideas. People can use words to engage in a criminal conspiracy. That's not protected speech. Just because you're using words to engage in a criminal conspiracy doesn't make it protected by the First Amendment or any principle of free expression. You can use words to engage in fraud or deceptive advertising. The use of words for these activities unrelated to the mere expression of ideas are not protected. You can use words to incite people to violence or lawlessness. You can use words to harass someone or threaten them. All of these categories, 
libel, threats, harassment, incitement, all of these are recognized exceptions to free speech protections. But what they all have in common, at least in the law as it currently exists in the United States, is that they are defined in a way where you need more than the mere expression of an idea to step over the line into unprotected speech. Speech can be threatening or harassing, and threats and harassment are not protected. But in the law, the mere expression of a viewpoint cannot in and of itself be considered unprotected threats or harassment. Anyway, that's our deceptively simple thesis. On campuses, all ideas can be expressed. Or to put it another way, campus officials cannot censor or punish people merely because of the views they express. So why in the world would anyone think such a thing was a good thesis to advocate, especially when we know that some ideas are properly considered hateful, risky, or dangerous. So this brings me to the second main point I want to make, which is to touch briefly on the main arguments that have accumulated over the centuries for why some people support broad protections for free expression. First, freedom of expression, in our view, is essential to any notion of freedom of thought. If you believe that people should be free to think as independent, autonomous human beings, you need some commitment to freedom of expression in order to accomplish that goal. If someone is controlling the range of opinion that you are exposed to, because they consider some opinions dangerous or risky or threats to the state or against your best interest, then your ideas are not your own. You lose your ability to assess competing points of view and develop your own worldview. Now, of course, there's a risk that if all ideas can be expressed, you'll hear some things that will turn you into a menace. But defenders of free expression argue that this risk is less threatening to our collective well-being than the risk of government thought control and allowing the official censorship of ideas. So first, freedom of expression, we believe, is essential to any notion of freedom of thought. Second, freedom of expression, I think, also is essential to any conception of democracy and self-government. If the powerful can prevent a free people from engaging in robust debate about matters of public consequence, then the people cannot assess their well-being, they cannot imagine alternative paths, or hold their leaders accountable. The free exchange of ideas is probably even more important to democracy than the holding of elections. Since without the right of the people to debate and criticize, elections are meaningless, lots of authoritarians hold elections. Third, and most importantly when thinking about these issues in a university context, freedom of expression is thought correctly, I think, to be essential to the practice of developing new knowledge. There's not a thing we all today believe to be true about social relations, about human rights, about the origins of life, about the workings of the universe. There's not a thing that today we believe to be true that was not once considered a heretical, dangerous challenge to the sacred dogma of the powerful. Just ask uh, Galileo. Finally, and maybe most importantly, the alternative to believing in broad protections to express ideas, the alternative being that government controls and regulates the circulation of ideas, the alternative to broad protections for expressing ideas has proven itself disastrous to freedom, democracy, and especially, and especially to the protections of vulnerable members of society who, by definition, are most likely to be silenced since no one in authority silences views that are supported by the status quo or by the powerful. Ideas can be harmful, there's no question. 
but empowering officials to censor ideas for those who believe in the broad protection of free expression, empowering officials to censor ideas is even more harmful. It doesn't always seem that way because we tend to think of the case for censorship as a one-off. All we're asking is for this particular person or group to be silenced as if they can be silenced while everything else stays the same. But the opposite of free speech isn't our current situation minus one set of speakers, where, for example, Milo and Richard Spencer are silenced while their critics face no risk to their own rights of expression. Rather, the opposite of free speech is empowering mayors, sheriffs, prosecutors, governors, presidents, attorneys general, university leaders, to punish people merely because of their views. And in our judgment, history is taught that you can't give officials the power to silence one person without establishing a precedent for the silencing of others. It is, by the way, one of the great ironies of how these debates sometimes unfold on campus that many of the advocates of more censorship have, in other circumstances, very healthy skepticism of existing authority figures and great political sophistication about what happens when you give officials power over the lives and thoughts of others. Censorship regimes, once established, never work out the way you expect. And so just imagine the power holder that you trust the least and then consider if you were to establish the proposition that public officials should be able to punish people merely for the expression of dangerous or hateful ideas, ask yourself how that person would use the power to prosecute people merely because of their viewpoints. Now, of course, the most controversial application of this argument has to do with hate speech. We dedicate an entire chapter of the book to the topic. The arguments for limiting hate speech are strong because the harms of hate speech are real and often devastating. We review the work in critical race theory and others that have outlined that very real harm. We review the serious arguments about how it marginalizes communities. And we note, by the way, that many liberal democracies, Canada, much of Western Europe, crit uh, criminalizes hate speech, and most people think they still have a right to call themselves free societies. And we also point out that the law in the United States is different. That doesn't tell us what the law should be, but it does clarify that currently, and for a very long time, what most people would consider hate speech is protected speech under longstanding First Amendment jurisprudence. And so it's not legal for public universities such as the University of California to enforce hate speech codes. For those who still advocate that that law be changed, reconsidered, engaged, challenged, we remind everyone that we've been down this road before. In the late 80s and early 90s, hundreds and hundreds of colleges and universities passed hate speech codes. Every single one of them that was challenged in federal court was struck down as unconstitutional citing problems with how hate speech was defined and citing problems with arbitrary and capricious enforcement of the standards. In the case, for example, that involved the University of Michigan, the witting litigant was a graduate student researcher who wanted to explore the possible cognitive differences between men and women, but pointed out that the hate speech code at Michigan was written in a way that that could be viewed as him stating opinions that potentially could be viewed as demeaning if he found some cognitive differences based on sex, and that could apply to his re make his research agenda a violation of university policy. Before advocating for hate speech codes, people should know the law and the history of the litigation. They should also know the history of how these laws historically have been enforced. For example, at the University of Michigan, not one white nationalist was prosecuted for racist speech under the code 
but a number of black anti-racism activists were prosecuted about after complaints that their anti-whiteness advocacy was a form of hate speech. After Great Britain passed its hate speech laws, one of the first groups prosecuted were Jews advocating on behalf of Israel because the UN had just declared Zionism to be a form of racism. And one of the most prosecuted people in Europe over the last 10 years or so is the actress Brigitte Bardot, whose animal rights advocacy has been considered a form of hate speech against religious practitioners who engage in animal sacrifice. More generally, much of what we debate as a society involves whether certain forms of expression should be considered harmful, insulting, or marginalizing. We debate songs, TV shows, forms of dress, internet memes, political party platforms. There's hardly an interesting thought that you might express that could not be characterized as wrongheaded, demeaning, or worse. And these debates are extremely important. And we benefit from things that we once took for granted as okay are re-described as demeaning and hateful and we're forced to reconsider. But because these debates are so ubiquitous and the views that people have on them are so varied and diverse, it has been proven up until now impossible to construct a definition of hate speech that avoids the risk of massive, arbitrary, ideologically-based censorship. Now, I mention these points not to resolve the issues but rather to recommend that the debates be fully informed by the current state of the law, by historic difficulties of creating a workable definition that won't be abused, and by real life experiences with their enforcement. In my view, arguments in favor of broad protections to express viewpoints should not be based on the claims that speech is always a positive force should not be based on a belief that free expression always leads to good outcomes or that bad ideas will always lose when forced to compete in the marketplace of ideas or that more speech mitigates all the harms of harmful speech. Rather, by contrasting free expression with the creation of censorship regimes, I mean to invoke a defense of free expression that is analogous to Winston Churchill's famous defense of democracy, that it is the worst form of government except for all the other forms of government. You can't make the case against democracy merely by pointing out its flaws as a way of organizing politics or by pointing out that sometimes the people make very bad decisions. Ultimately, I didn't know whether anybody would react to that uh, observation, that people occasionally may make very bad decisions. Ultimately, it must be assessed in comparison to the alternatives. And the same is true when we debate whether free expression is deserving of broad protections. And I believe that the history of free speech in the United States validates these arguments. Just in the history of the United States, before the rise of modern protections for free expression, the ability of government to punish people just for expressing views was used in the 1790s to jail political opponents of the Adams administration. It was used in the decades leading up to the Civil War to silence anti-slavery advocates. It was used in mid-century and the late 19th century to punish birth control advocates, to censor extraordinary works of literature, to fire professors who dared to teach about Darwin, or even research the advantages of labor rights. It was used to jail individuals who protested America's entry into World War I. It was used to destroy the lives of socialists and communists and others considered to be their sympathizers, and of course was used to attempt to suppress the civil rights movement. I understand that this is an empirical historical claim and you may have a different reading of the history and if so, we should and must discuss and debate it, but let's agree the debate will be better if we're more aware of the history and bring that history to these contemporary debates. So, I've mentioned the general arguments in favor of protecting free expression in society. 
In our view, the arguments for protecting the expression of ideas, those arguments are even stronger in the setting of higher education, which exists primarily to provide the conditions for hard thought and difficult debate so that new knowledge can be generated and individuals can develop their own capacity for independent thought. A, a central premise of modern higher ed is that all beliefs are contingent, that there are no officially protected dogmas in politics or in physics, that every idea may be challenged and put to the test. As the great 1960s era president of the University of California, Clark Kerr, put it, universities do not exist to make ideas safe for students, they exist to make students safe for ideas. Most fundamentally, modern higher education, when it is at its best, is in the idea assessment business. The mission is to prepare and empower people to engage ideas and when necessary, to be the vanguard of society that can expose and rebut bad, wrongheaded, or evil ideas. Still, while it's vitally important for colleges to welcome all ideas, the scope and protection for free expression is different in the professional realm of colleges and universities. That is, when faculty are engaged in the work of their profession, in their classrooms, labs, faculty meetings and conferences, it's different there than it is in the city square. And this gets to my next point. Academic freedom, as a vitally important value, may be related to free speech, but it's also a fundamentally different concept. A person who, in a public park, says that the moon is made of cheese will face no official consequences from the overhearing mayor or police officer. But a faculty member in an astronomy department who expresses the same opinion should expect to have those views reviewed by peers, and those peers may conclude that she should be denied tenure because her views do not demonstrate mastery of the required disciplinary knowledge. In the public park, an average person's Expression of that idea cannot be used against them. In the professorate, all we do is evaluate ideas in the professional context and reward or not reward people based on an analysis of the content of their ideas. Similarly, when a person on their private Facebook page expresses the view that members of a certain political party are enemies of the country, they should face no official consequences. But a faculty member would face consequences if he announced in class that members of a certain political party were not welcome in his classroom. In short, rights of expression associated with academic freedom are inextricably linked to the obligations that professional faculty have to act in accordance with norms of professional conduct and ethical behavior. And this has been true ever since the idea of academic freedom was first invented by the Association of American University Professors early in the 20th century. In other words, the free speech rights of faculty on their Twitter feeds is different than their rights in the classroom. And this means for us that as long as faculty in professional settings are conducting themselves in a manner consistent with professional competence and ethics, they should be protected against any effort to punish them for views that they express outside of those contexts. Once we have a basic understanding of the principles of free speech and academic freedom, we can begin to sketch out what campuses in general can and can't do with respect to speech. In our book, we devote an entire chapter to lots of cans and can'ts. I'll give you a feel for a couple of these ideas, and we can talk more about other circumstances if you like. So just to get our bearings on this, a matched group of cans and can'ts. In our view, a campus cannot censor or punish speech merely because a person or group considers it offensive or harmful. But a campus can censor or punish speech that meets the legal criteria 
for harassment or true threats or other speech acts unprotected by the First Amendment. A campus, in our view, cannot deny a speaker a forum merely because of disagreement with her or his views. But a campus can impose restrictions of what time they can speak, restrictions on where they can speak, and restrictions on how they can speak, so-called time, place, and manner restrictions, as long as those restrictions are viewpoint neutral and designed to promote the legitimate interest of the campus in safety or the prevention of the disruption of the legitimate work of the campus. People have a right to express their views, but not at a place or time of their choosing, such as the middle of a freeway or in the middle of my classroom when we're teaching my class. A campus can't censor or punish some speakers, but not others, for putting up handbills or writing messages in chalk or engaging in similar acts of expression. But a campus can create what are known in the law as limited public forums for certain limited expressive purposes. So for example, it's absolutely legitimate for a campus to create a space on campus, a bulletin board or a wall, that is designated to be used by student groups to advertise their activities, or that could be used only by graduate division to announce their activities. So long as once those limited activities are defined, you engage in no additional viewpoint-based discrimination. So if you set up a bulletin board that students group, student groups can use, if someone puts up something that is not a message from a student group, you can take it down. But if the college Democrats put up something that the college Republicans don't like, the college, you, college Republicans cannot ask the university to take down the college Republic, uh, the Democrat group and vice versa. Once you define the terms of the forum, you have to apply it in a viewpoint neutral way. And finally, just as an example, a campus can and should expect administrators to speak out against especially egregious speech acts, but a campus cannot expect university administrators to comment or condemn on every campus speech act that some person considers offensive because otherwise that would be our full-time job. And a campus is not free to create a culture of free expression if administrators are acting as a hovering editorial board over every act of expression on a campus. Now, some of these cans and cans have become much more complicated on campuses in the face of the challenges that arise, that arose last year from very large scale events and protests that genuinely create danger uh, on campus and elsewhere. So in early 2017, as you know, when, Michael Yana uh, when Milo Yiannopoulos was scheduled to speak at UC Berkeley, the campus took extraordinary steps to ensure the event would take place. Other University of California campuses sent police reinforcements. A wide perimeter was established around the venue. Barricades were set up to create a safety zone between protesters and people attending the event. Milo spoke on our campus twice. We took exactly the same sorts of steps. The events went off. While appropriately, hundreds of students decided to express alternative points of view as they should. But Berkeley faced something that my campus, or before January of 20, uh, of uh, two years, of a year and a half ago, no campus had ever faced. And that was 150 black clad rioters associated with the anarchist group Black Bloc, many of them wearing masks, helmets, body armor, armed with pole sticks and commercial grade fireworks. They ignited fires, hurled Molotov cocktails, destroyed barricades, smashed windows, and attacked individuals. An ordinary student protest had become an unmanageable riot, overwhelming campus police and forcing cancellation of the event. Matters became much more disturbing and tragic in late August 2017, when white nationalist Richard Spencer was scheduled to speak at a Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. The night before the rally, as you know, several hundred torch-bearing white nationalists marched on the main quadrangle of the University of Virginia grounds, shouting such things as, you will not replace us, and Jew will not replace us. When counter-protesters engaged the group, 
Marchers threw their torches toward students and a brawl ensued. And the next day when the groups converged with self-styled militia members dressed in full camouflage and outfitted with semi-automatic rifles and pistols, with white nationalists carrying large seals and long wooden clubs, shields and long wooden clubs, they charged through a line of counter-protesters swinging sticks, punching and spraying chemicals. And not long after police ordered the groups to disperse, a member of the white nationalist group drove a car into a crowd, killing Heather Heyer. And not long after that incident, Richard Spencer was able to speak at the University of Florida, but only after the campus made extensive security efforts and the, de the governor declared a state of emergency. Spencer also spoke at Auburn and Michigan State after federal judges prevented each university from denying him access. At Michigan State, 100 officers in riot gear broke up fights and made arrests. And then there was the summer of 2017, the Milo Free Speech Week at Berkeley that never went off, but nevertheless required Berkeley, in light of what they experienced of January 2017, to spend over $3.9 million for security. So how should campuses handle this? As a general rule of law, if the protection of speech imposes costs on a public entity, if, for example, pro-diversity anti-fascists want to demonstrate in the wake of Charlottesville in Boston, on Boston Commons, and they expect to bring thousands of people there, and the police know they have to mobilize, then those costs must be borne, in this case by the city of Boston, and can't be imposed on those demonstrators as a condition for them exercising their rights. Nobody told those anti-fascist demonstrators in Boston after Charlottesville, you can march on Boston Commons, but you first have to write us a check for a million and a half dollars. It is, in general, a violation of free speech norms to charge some groups more for the right to speak than others, merely because some views are more controversial and invite more counter demonstrations. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't always charge groups a different amount, as long as you're focusing on the costs associated with the parts of the event within their control. If some outside group wants to do a screening of a film and they expect 20 people and you don't have to hire any additional parking attendants or any security, they get charged a certain amount for renting the campus facility. If you want instead to create an event of 400 people, they're all going to come at a certain time and a campus has to hire a lot more parking attendants and create just the normal amount of security for that group, that's completely legitimate. But what you can't do is impose the costs that others would create because of their protest of that activity. That would mean that people who express non-controversial views can always express those views without any special cost. If you want to say something controversial, it's going to cost you, and that violates free speech norms as they exist in American law today. Now, it does raise the question, if someone decided every single month that they were going to create enough havoc at Berkeley that every single month there was a $4 million bill to be paid, at some point there is going to be a limit on whether you have to choose between the protection of free speech rights and the essential solvency of the entire institution. No institution, no municipality, Boston itself are not obligated to protect all rights so much that it leads to the entire destruction of that government entity. But until such time as that situation arises, we do take inspiration from Berkeley's extraordinary efforts in 2017 to do all they can to commit themselves to the protection of free expression rights. Then again, UCLA just recently has implemented a new policy that provides a total yearly budget of $100,000 to pay for security for events sponsored by external groups. And after that $100,000 is exhausted, no external groups can do events on the UCLA campus according to this policy, and we will see whether that policy is constitutional or workable. At the same time, universities have a clear and compelling legal and ethical duty to protect the safety of students, staff, and faculty. 
campuses have to, in my, in my judgment, accommodate the battle of ideas, but they don't have to become actual battlegrounds. Campuses do not need to stand helpless when mobs gather to initiate and provoke violence. People do not enter a campus in large groups with body armor, bats, helmets, shields, masks, and pepper spray to listen to a lecture. And there is no constitutional right to bring such items onto a campus in a way that risks the violence and safety of the community. So that's what I want to say about the current state of our debate about free speech. I do want to end by reiterating that alongside this debate is an absolute campus obligation to create non-discriminatory and inclusive learning environments. And I know that in the context where certain ideas are viewed as marginalizing, the issue that many of us are debating and talking about is whether it undermines the commitment to an inclusive learning environment to allow certain ideas to circulate. And that's a completely legitimate argument, and I've stated my case for why I think it's necessary to protect the expression of all ideas. But I do want to remind ourselves that there are many, many things that campuses must and should do beyond the regulation of ideas to promote an inclusive and non-discriminatory learning environment. And let me end just by reminding ourselves of what campuses should and must do in this circumstance. Campuses can and must protect the rights of all students to engage in meaningful protest and to distribute materials that get their message out about their place in the community. Campuses must punish speech that, con that constitutes th uh, true threats or that meets the definition of harassment under federal anti-discrimination law. Campuses should prevent the disruption of university activities, including the disruption of students who are exercising their rights in a way that other students disagree with. Campus should ensure that campus dormitories are safe spaces of repose. Campuses should prevent discrimination by official campus organizations. They should allow faculty, but not require them, to use trigger warnings when they deem it appropriate to protect the sensibility of students in light of the faculty member's best pedagogical judgment. The campus should and must sensitize the campus community to the harms caused by microaggressions and the effects of implicit bias. Campuses should and must ensure that learning environments are safe for the civil expression of ideas. Campuses should and must require institution-wide training on the obligation to create inclusive workplaces and educational environments. Campuses should establish clear reporting requirements so that incidents of discriminatory practices can be quickly investigated and addressed. They should establish clear and effective grievance procedures for those who believe that the institution is not taking seriously its legal obligations to create non-discriminatory learning environments. They must prohibit retaliation against any person who complains about a discriminatory workplace. They must promulgate clear and powerful principles of community, stressing the importance of an inclusive environment and condemning hateful or stigmatizing speech. They should encourage faculty and students to research and learn about the harms associated with intolerance and structural racism, including through the creation of appropriate academic departments the establishment of educational requirements on diversity and structural inequality, the publication of research and the sponsoring of academic symposia. Campuses should organize co-curricular activities that celebrate cultural diversity and provide victims of hateful and bullying acts the opportunity to be heard. Campuses should emphasize how the campus's scholarly mission is best accomplished when people of diverse backgrounds and perspectives work together in an environment of mutual respect and positive, constructive engagement, and should speak out to condemn egregious acts of intolerance as a way of demonstrating the power of more speech rather than enforced silence. And my hope is if campuses do all these things, maybe it does not seem quite as consequential that in addition to all of those things, they set up regimes to punish the mere expression of 
ideas, but we will see. So thank you so much for listening, and I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Thanks so much.